Okay, good afternoon, everybody. And um, we're going to carry on our discussion about drugs and today about toxicology. Toxicology is the study of drugs um, in circulation, basically, the identification of drugs um, in circulation, the identification of the quantity of drugs present, and a toxicologist might even be called on in a court of law to testify as to the impact of that particular concentration of a particular drug on human functioning, on what kind of behavioral aspects we might expect. So not surprisingly, the drug which is most frequently examined for and tested for is alcohol since alcohol is the most widely abused drug um, in our population. And um, alcohol has been well characterized. So the concentrations of alcohol in the blood, for example, um, it can be a very good predictor, as we've seen, of certain behavioral changes, etc. So it becomes really important to be able to quickly um, identify that somebody is uh, under the influence of alcohol. And um, very often people might on the surface appear not to be under the influence when in actual fact they do have alcohol present and any amount of alcohol present is going to be an impediment to full functioning. And it's a simple fact. Um, it, it's picked, especially in uh, terms of dealing with traffic, um, it, it, a lot of energy is expended in trying to pull out drivers who are driving under the influence. The blood alcohol, legal blood alcohol level is 0.08% in the United States. And that's 0 0.08 grams of alcohol per 100 milliliters. Um, or 0.8 grams per liter. And um, I should tell you that in other countries in the world, there are many countries where the blood alcohol legal limit is far lower um, because it is recognized that even at 0 0.08, although that is the legal limit, there can be substan substantial impairment of driving ability. So that is why um, traffic police people like that, expend so much time and energy trying to filter out drivers who might be inebriated. They are a tremendous danger on the road. So the, really the only way to determine blood alcohol concentration accurately, really accurately, um, is either by taking a blood sample or by using a very highly specialized um, machine uh, in uh, essentially a laboratory setting. Um, but the course taking blood is not possible in a field setting and um, carting around huge amounts of equipment is also not feasible. So in a field setting, uh, police will rely upon a field tester, a breath of what we now commonly referred as a breathalyzer. And this um, works on the principle that the amount of, of alcohol which we breathe out is directly proportional to the amount of alcohol circulating in the blood circulatory system. So a field tester that a policeman might use is sufficiently accurate to be able to indicate that a person is above or close to the legal limit of, of alcohol usage. Um, but a field tester is not accepted in a court of law. Instead, the, uh, if somebody is pulled out as having uh, being over the limit on a field test, that field test has to be corroborated and it has to be corroborated either with a blood draw or by using a highly specialized machine, which is works something like a, a breathalyzer, uh, but is very, very accurate. And that is done in, uh, can be done if the 
uh, precinct has such a machine or else in a laboratory setting where such a machine is present. So no, just let me once. Um, so the, in the field, the machine itself is not, may not be sufficient evidence for an officer to remove somebody from the road. The idea of testing on the road is not simply to arrest people and make money. It is to get people off the road who, who are driving while they are impaired. That impairment can also be revealed by various physical tests as well. So that's very, this is what we'll, you'll see is that drivers will be tested with a field test machine, the breathalyzer. They are asked to breathe into it. And they are then subjected to a set of physical exercises, um, all of which are designed to test coordination, for example, hand-eye coordination, balance, all of these subtle things which are very quickly impacted when somebody is inebriated. So this is a typical roadside tester. Um, it is good enough to get a good idea about what the blood alcohol levels are. Um, remembering that blood alcohol levels are directly related to the amount of alcohol that people do breathe out. Um, however, as I've told you, this is, not, this is not good enough for presentation in a court of law. Um, in, uh, nor uh, really if, uh, if somebody like, is a little bit below the level um, of, on the tester, but uh, the officer pulls them out and performs a set of physical field tests, which they fail, then that is evidence enough that they be removed from the roads and be arrested for driving under the influence. So th there are various sets of tests. First of all, there's, uh, the, there's things like um, just putting your finger on your nose or doing it with your eyes closed. There's uh, tests to test uh, coordination, like we're walking heel to toe, heel to toe, heel to toe. Um, there are memory tests. Memory is very profoundly affected uh, by alcohol. And um, then there are some tests of reflexes. And uh, one of the really important ones is called the horizontal gaze nystagmus test. Now, nystagmus refers to a strange physical phenomenon. And that is that when the eyes move back and forth without control. And uh, what they will do, what the officer, sorry, what the officer will do, where is my picture of nystagmus. I was sure I had a picture. No. Um, just give me one second, will you? There. I had it hidden. I'm sorry. Okay. Here's a, this is the picture of nystagmus. Um, so, uh, uh, normally, if, um, if uh, for instance, a doctor wants to test this, uh, your reflexes, they will move a finger back and forth in front of your face, ask you to track it with your eyes. Norm the normal ability is to track is your eyeballs will move smoothly or relatively smoothly as the, as the finger moves. In somebody who is inebriated, however, that, that these reflexes that control the eye movement become impaired. And as the, the eye wanders away toward, as it gets towards about 45 degrees, the eyeball begins to shudder like this. And this is nystagmus. And it is a very, very good indicator that the person who's being tested is in fact inebriated. So apart from that, um, tests for balance, standing on one leg. Some of us, me included, can't do that very well any, anyway. But the picture that you need to get is that this is not one single thing which pulls the person off. It's a combination of attributes which suggest this person's abilities 
both mental and physical, are impaired to the extent that they should be removed from the road, usually by arrest. And um, by the way, I've put in here a little, a little video for you just for fun from Reno 911. This, is, this will show you how not to conduct field tests. A failed field sobriety test will automatically result in arrest. As I've said, this is not so that jurisdictions can make money. It is to actively remove people who are impaired from the road. And, um, but that arrest has to be backed up by further testing and quickly. And the one way in which this can be done is to move to using a, a, um, a laboratory grade breathalyzer, a breath tester, which is sufficiently accurate that it will in fact be acceptable uh, as evidence in a court of law. And the most common one that is used is an infrared um, light machine. It uses infrared light, which is light which has a longer wavelength than visible light. The breath, when the, it, the sample, breath sample is breathed into the machine, it passes in front of the uh, infrared light source and a detector measures how much um, of the infrared light is absorbed. And that is directly proportional to the concentration of alcohol. And this is extremely accurate. Um, if such a machine is not available, which in some jurisdictions it is not, uh, here's somebody being subjected to it. Um, then if the, such a machine is not available, then that field sobriety test needs to be um, confirmed by a blood alcohol draw. And um, the blood alcohol draw is, has to be done under very carefully controlled circumstances by a qualified phlebotomist. And the blood sample has to be really carefully treated. It must be have chemicals in it which prevent co uh, coagulation of the blood. And it must be immediately refrigerated so that no further changes can take place in, in the blood. Um, and the, these uh, examinations, they are standard procedure in many clinical labs, uh, but it may, this may actually be sent if the precinct has access to a forensic lab, the samples will be sent to a forensic lab. So um, the blood which is drawn is evidence. So it gets entered into the chain of custody. It is extremely important that that blood sample um, be tracked from the vein where it was drawn from to the laboratory testing machine or whatever is used. Um, it is extremely easy, unfortunately, in laboratories which deal with many, many blood samples, it is very easy to get them confused. And this is a standard uh, strategy of uh, defense is to call into question the chain of custody on such blood samples. Now, there is one particular instance when um, things become really difficult, and that is when somebody has died and the involvement of alcohol in needs to be determined. Either somebody who's died in a car accident, perhaps, or a body um, which is found. Um, the difficulty is that actually some of the decomposition processes that take place can actually raise the blood alcohol level. And um, th this is a well-documented phenomenon, but the, this is one of the reasons why from some, at autopsy, a wide variety of body fluids are actually sampled, not just the blood but cerebrospinal fluid, for example, brain tissue itself will be tested. And then one which I mentioned sometime before, I told you it was kind of special, which is the vitreous humor of the eye, of the eyeball. Vitreous humor picks up alcohol rather more slowly than many of the body fluids, but it keeps it for much longer. 
So it provides a good historic record of what of alcohol exposure by uh, in in somebody who has died. So the issue of actually testing somebody, even in, uh, testing somebody in the field, then bringing them in and testing them um, under essentially laboratory conditions is a contentious one because we have to remember the Fourth Amendment, which protects us against illegal search and seizure or unreasonable search and seizure. Throughout the United States, there are a, a set of laws which are called the per se, per se laws. It just means like that. It's just like that. If you, if you don't like it, then your only option is arrest. So the, the, the first set of per se laws state that anybody who has a blood alcohol level of over 0 0.08 is deemed to be intoxicated, no matter how well they behave, no matter what their claims are about what they can and cannot do, even when it looks like they, they are performing quite normally, their blood alcohol level is over 0.08%. They are deemed to be intoxicated and they will be arrested. The same thing is true for failing at field sobriety tests. No matter what excuses the person comes up with, no matter what claims they make, if they fail field sobriety tests, then they are deemed to be intoxicated. One of the reasons for this is that that blood alcohol, the legal limit, 0 0.08 is actually quite high. And substantial impairment will, occur, will ha already have occurred well below there. So this is, this is really a generous limit for, for, for people to enjoy. And they actually, even below that blood alcohol level, the blood alcohol level is not an indication of safety. It is simply a legal limit which at, at above which somebody is deemed to, to be so intoxicated that they will in fact be arrested. At 0.08%, a driver is four times more likely to become involved in an accident. But this, the relationship between blood alcohol level and liability for an accident is not a, is not a straight line. It's actually an exponential. And if we have a look here, here is the, um, here is 0 0.08, there's the legal limit. This is the likelihood, the relative chances of having an accident. Look at the shape of that curve. It's not a straight line. It's not a straight line like this or straight line like this. It's an exponential curve, which is extremely steep. Here's a very low, what we would consider a low blood alcohol level, a couple of drinks probably in an hour and, and a, an hour or so to, to recover, 0 0.04. The likelihood of getting involved in an accident is not zero by any means. There is, yours, that person is still impaired. But look at 0 0.08, the legal limit, and you'll see that the, the chances of getting into an accident have more than quadrupled. Now, just consider maybe we, the person uh, has an even higher blood alcohol level. These are not alcohol levels, by the way, which are extraordinary. These are the kinds of alcohol, blood alcohol levels you measure in many people at a party or in a bar or somewhere like that after several hours of drinking. A blood alcohol level 0.15% has 25 times greater likelihood of being involved in an accident. These are ex actually extraordinary figures. And it's no surprise that in fact, alcohol is frequently involved in car accidents and of one description or another, and especially in fatal accidents. Um, I have here, because we're in uh, New York, and this is such a famous case, I've given you here some links to one of um, uh, New York's most notorious drunk driving cases. 
and um, this is a case of a woman <coughs> who um, ended up uh, killing um, eight people, three strangers, herself, and three children, her own children, and the children of her of her brother, who was who were in the car with her. And um, this is when, after the accident had happened and they measured her blood alcohol level, it was an absolutely extraordinarily high blood alcohol level. I can't remember exactly what it was, it was around 0.15, something like that. Um, and remembering that um, women tend to be much more impaired than men for various reasons, but it is simply a fact that um, a, a lower blood, women are impaired by a lower blood alcohol level than men and clear alcohol more slowly than men. In any case, you can follow, I'm not gonna discuss it any further, but if you want to, you can follow that up. It's a tragic story. Okay, so um, another of the per se laws is that most states have um, an implied consent law. And um, this means that if you are in a car and you're driving and a policeman stops you, you have already given consent to be tested for alcohol. You get, once you get into your car and you get onto a highway uh, or a road, then the, your consent is implied. And if you refuse to be tested for alcohol, you will immediately probably be arrested, but certainly will lose your license and will lose it for a time to be determined by the courts. Um, the reason for this is to get people who have any possibility of being drunk, get them off the road. Your loss of license is immediate. If you refuse to be tested, your loss of license is immediate. If you then try to drive away, you will be arrested for driving without a license, with a canceled license. Is a very, very, these are very, very strict laws, but they have resulted in the decrease in the number of drunk driving accidents uh, right across the nation. Um, and as I say, in other countries, they are far more stringent. We have quite liberal uh, drink and driving laws. So that is the law of implied consent. Okay, so let's just say, um, a blood sample is taken. Where does that blood sample go? Well, it goes um, to a forensic lab um, for forensic examination. And uh, the examination is a forensic toxicology exam. And a forensic toxicology exam is going to identify, uh, try to identify what drugs are in circulation, um, their concentration. And then as I've told you, the toxicologist may be called on to come to a court of law and testify, well, somebody who has this particular drug at such and such a concentration is likely to behave in this way or that way or another way. The toxicologist faces a daunting task, not in the case of alcohol, um, which is relatively easy to test for, but very frequently a toxicologist will be presented with blood samples where the drug is unknown and has then got to try and identify what that drug is. They have to identify what the drug is before they can determine what the concentration is because each drug requires its own testing to determine concentration. Now here, there are a number of problems. The first is that drugs in circulation in the body may be in circulation at very, very low concentrations. This is uh, not like being presented with a pill or a capsule and asked to identify what is inside the pill or the capsule. That would also be the job of a toxicologist, but if a toxicologist has to identify drugs which are in circulation, they are dealing with drugs which are in very, very low concentration in a very large volume of circulating body fluid. That's the first problem. Second, the body metabolizes drugs very rapidly. As soon as drugs enter the body, our body begins to break it down, break them down, especially the kidneys and the liver, um, and begin to excrete them, for example, into the urine, break them down into the component parts that are 
quite different to the original drug. So toxicologists may not only look, have to look for the drug itself, they may have to look for the breakdown product as well in order to assess what the original concentration was. The third um, thing is that there are just a gazillion drugs. If a, if a toxicologist, if somebody is found um, dead, for example, um, or uh, unconscious, unable to communicate, and there is indication that they may have been using drugs, but there is no indication of what drug they actually used. They're already unconscious or maybe dead. The toxicologist is presented with the dilemma. They have very quickly got to try and identify what drugs are present in the blood, but they have no handle on how that, uh, how to do that. There are many, many drugs that could have, have been used. And they very often have to depend upon uh, information given to them, for instance, by law enforcement to try and assess what is likely the range of drugs that this person is this person somebody that was known to use opiates for example is this somebody who is known to use something like ketamine or some something else or exotic drugs um, all in an attempt to narrow the field the once that drug has been identified, it's the role of the toxicologist to determine what the actual toxicity is um, and to assess what the level of impairment might be for the concentration that they, me that they measure. Was the concentration of drug sufficient, for example, to cause the death? Was the concentration of drug so great that um, functioning uh, like uh, suppression of violence, etc., was likely to be affected. All of those kinds of things, they might be called on to make an assessment of. Now, typically, um, this testing would be done on blood uh, from a living person, would be tested on the blood. In, from autopsy, it could be done for many different body fluids and also for body tissues to try and find it out. Um, increasingly, urine testing is being used as a measure of drug use, but urine testing is a very poor method for measuring actual concentration. It can only, it really in for the most part, it only indicates the drug usage has taken place. It does not tell you much about how much of a particular drug a person took. So it can be used, for instance, in workplace um, and in rehabilitation programs, this sort of thing. Um, urine testing is done just to see whether or not people have actually used drugs at all, but it does, does not provide any of this kind of information for us. Okay, so we return just briefly to this, the question of the Fourth Amendment and um, unreasonable search and seizure. Um, uh, it could validly be argued that taking blood, for example, is um, highly intrusive and um, that it, it comes under the rubric of unreasonable search and seizure. But the Supreme Court um, in 1966 ruled that it was not protected by the Fourth Amendment any more, for example, than fingerprinting, uh, taking your fingerprints was, that it, uh, they regarded as an essential part of the investigative process and uh, that it was not covered by the Constitution. However, in 2013, there was something of a reversal of that. And um, the the Supreme Court then ruled that a warrant should be obtained for a blood sample. That warrant is very easily obtained because the um, breathalyzer test is not covered by the Fourth Amendment. And um, as a result, uh, if, if it is required, then go to, to a, a judge and say, 
we require an urgent blood draw because this person's blood alcohol level on is above such and such, it would probably be very swiftly granted. Okay, so let's go, just think about the, this one single fact which faces the forensic toxicologists above everything else. And that is that they have so many different kinds of drugs that they need to test for. And um, they uh, uh, will gather, forensic toxicologists will gather as much information as they possibly can from law enforcement about the behavior of the person, about the circumstances uh, under which the person was found or arrested or, or whatever, what their behavior was like and police will, uh, will often also make an initial assessment. For example, they can see, are the, were the person's um, pupils of their eyes dilated um, or were they constricted? Uh, was their behavior the sort of behavior one would expect from, from an upper um, or from, uh, or is it something that one would associate more with a depressant? Um, those, all of those are important pieces of information for a forensic toxicologist. And, but it is still very likely that they're going to have to use some general screening of the samples in order to narrow down <clears throat> what they're going to zoom in on to and concentrate on. So it's a, a logical kind of uh, analytical scheme and that initial screening tests will allow a, a tentative, a tentative uh, diagnosis of what drugs are present. And then those can be extensively tested for. And the most common methods that are, are used nowadays, um, I'm not actually going to discuss how they work. I simply want you to know the names of the machines. These two machines are very frequently used in combination with one another. And they are a gas chromatograph, which basically um, the sample is taken and it is heated uh, to, so that the substances go into gaseous phase. They then pass through a column. The column effectively retards some of the gases more than others. And it ends up uh, producing uh, uh, something that looks, it's, it looks like this. That these are measures of concentration of different substances, and they emerge at specific times from the column. Um, so what's happening here is that we're sorting substances, and um, there may be class of substances in each of these peaks. Okay, so you can you can we can just use a, uh, an idea. Okay, maybe these are one kind of opiate. And these are another kind of opiate, um, that sort of thing. So this would give a gas chromatograph on its own can give a very good idea of the classes of substances that are present. But it is often used in combination, and they're usually built into one single machine of another um, a very high tech piece of machinery called a mass spectrometer, which actually measures the atomic structure and characteristics of substances. And the combination of these two provide a very, very specific analysis, very often down to a particular a substance. And even if uh, in some cases would be able to say this particular substance manufactured by such and such a manufacturer, if it has particular atomic and chemical characteristics. So this combination, just remember them, gas chromatography and mass spectrometry are used um, to do, uh, especially to examine samples where the original substance is unknown and very frequently provides a very good identification of the substances. The, in addition, the gas chromatography and mass spectrometry can give an idea about the concentration of, of those substances in the original sample. 
and there are other there, there are other analytical techniques. Once the substance has been identified, there are other analytical techniques to determine the concentration. And the blood concentration uh, association with physiological and neurological response for many drugs is well characterized. Alcohol is an example. We know very well that a blood alcohol concentration such and such has a produces a, a brain tissue concentration of a certain amount. And that brain tissue concentration produces the following neurological effects, reduced response time, nystagmus, what, or what, whatever. And for many commonly used drugs, the impact has been experimentally determined. So there is good scientific backing to, to this. this the, the, I'm sorry to do this. I've got a little fly flying right in front. I'm not blessing you all. I'm trying to get rid of a fly. Um, for many of these, although the, the association between concentration and certain behavioral things is well established, nonetheless, it does come down sometimes to a, the opinion of the toxicologist as to what a impact a particular blood concentration may have had on somebody in commission of a crime. Okay, so um, just to repeat um, the, the issue of um, drugs in urine, um, there is, I might tell you, there is controversy about the use of uh, urine samples, about the taking of urine sample as to whether that truly is constitutional, but that is something which I leave you, you to think about and discuss if you ever end up in a law class. Nonetheless, it is very widely uh, accepted as a condition of employment or whatever that you may be called on periodically to deliver a urine sample um, under controlled conditions. Um, however, uh, currently, uh, urine samples really do not give good information of a history of drug use, except to say that within a certain time period, um, a drug has been taken. How much? It's very difficult to say. Um, but uh, it is a simple, it provides a simple yes, no answer. And um, I, uh, this is a standard examination technique. I don't know if any of you have done it or seen it, but there is a, a special urine cup that has little bars around the side, little color indicators for all the different drugs. And it responds very, very quickly to the presence of drugs uh, in the urine by changing color. And we'll say, okay, this person in the previous 48 hours or whatever has used marijuana, um, or this person has used heroin, et cetera, et cetera. When people take drugs, however, um, a tremendous amount depends on their own physiology as to what their responses are going to be. All of the things, gender, age, size, health, etc., all make a difference. In addition, people who use drugs regularly develop tolerance. So they require, they can take a higher dosage of, uh, of the drug without appearing to suffer the, the effects that a novice would, would feel from that same amount. Um, but that, that's, this actually makes it very difficult to assess, to stand in a court of law and say that somebody who has taken, had a concentration of drugs of such and such in their blood, most likely had a, a set of impairments, which the toxicologist can describe. The person may then turn around and be able to say, well, I don't have those impairments. Um, does not have that effect on me. The, it becomes a sub, can become a subjective argument. Um, the, the one uh, area where uh, historic use of drugs can be really, really well established is in fact, if we look at hair here, I was quite, dis have been quite disparaging about hair analysis in the past. 
But here is one area where hair analysis can be extremely accurate and extremely scientific as well. When hair grows, drugs, it, it obviously it starts off as living tissue in that follicle with a little papilla at the bottom, that is living tissue, which is generating the hairs which pack together to form the hair itself. As that, that happens in a continuous basis, about a centimeter a, a month or so, and that the hair will grow. During drug usage, drugs permeate every tissue in the body, and in, that includes the hair follicle. So drugs become embedded in that hair as it grows. And hair can form a very good his historical record of drug usage. If we pull out hair and analyze the hair by length, down its length, we'll be able to find that drugs, if, if drugs have been used, they will have been deposited in the hair most recent drug usage down near the root of the hair, most uh, the oldest drug usage up near the tip of the hair. Now, in, uh, this is regularly done for many drugs. It, it can be, be done for all sorts of drugs, but it is also done for things like heavy metals, for example, arsenic, bismuth, antimony, mercury, um, and this one, which is a favorite of uh, mystery writers, thallium, um, these are all heavy metals and <clears throat> they're extremely poisonous. They are used um, in murder as murder weapons, but they um, also can be ingested as food contaminants, but also as environmental pollutants. And um, some of them are naturally occurring in relatively high amounts in soil, for example, but they may also arise from industrial processes and be spewed as pollutants. So these, if you are exposed to these, you will in fact incorporate them into your hair as it grows. So taking a sample of hair, a lock of hair, in the old days, what they would do is they would cut this up into little tiny sections, carefully keeping them in order and would test each section for whatever. Nowadays, um, there are techniques of machines where you can pass the entire lock of hair through the machine. And um, it actually also uses mass spectrometry in order to, to assess uh, what is present in the hair and very, very quickly produces a, a record of substances which are present in the hair, not only things like heavy metals, but also other drugs, um, even marijuana can, can be detected in hair. Um, so uh, this is a very, very useful technique and gives a very good historical record of drug usage. Okay, just to also mention um, that uh, not all poisons are drugs. And in fact, one of the commonest poisons that is encountered is carbon monoxide. And um, carbon monoxide has a peculiar effect. Um, and that is it binds to uh, no, our normal functioning. The hemoglobin in our blood transports oxygen. And um, it doesn't normally transport uh, carbon dioxide. The carbon dioxide is transported in the serum of the blood largely and in the cytoplasm of red blood corpuscles, not on the hemoglobin. But carbon dioxide is uh, the end product of burning of, of complete combustion. Carbon monoxide, CO, is the product of incomplete combustion. And it is a very, very frequent byproduct of a fire. And it's the commonest cause of death in a fire. And uh, toxicologists are very frequently called on to determine the concentration of carbon monoxide in the blood samples from people who have died in fires or else been accidentally exposed to carbon monoxide. Sometimes, for example, uh, people suffer long-term illness because uh, maybe they've got a furnace which is not 
working properly. And they have elevated but not fatal levels of carbon monoxide. And carbon monoxide binds to hemoglobin and it binds irreversibly. It just sits on the hemoglobin and it stops it from being able to transport oxygen. That's how it works. Um, in fatal cases, it produces uh, this very distinctive color because it, when hemoglobin binds carbon monoxide, it turns this bright cherry pink color. And that colors the whole body. People who've died of carbon monoxide poisoning often look very healthy because they've got the, instead of having the pale pallor that normally comes with death, instead they have this bright cherry pink look to them. And uh, again, the levels of carbon monoxide are determined by spectrophotometric methods. Uh, they can be used. Gas chromatography, for example, can, can be used. Um, but there are other chemical methods to do so as well. Okay, so that's that for toxicology. And then I will see you um, on Wednesday. Don't forget, please, that you have a, a test. Um, this is a somewhat shorter test than normal. It's 40 questions for 80 points. So it'll be just be an hour.